just overcome the will of our client. So much so that we're running everything without listening to the client. That's why we emphasize communication, scope of representation, all of those things. So what about diminished capacity? You see it on page 233. What do you, as an attorney, have to do under this rule? What do we have to do?
So of course that means not being dismissive uh, just because you may determine that the client uh, has diminished capacity. So always looking to the client. Comment three even says, uh, even if you confer with other family members or someone that can help you make some assessment, the lawyer must keep the client's interest foremost. Must look to the client. I'll just look, keep client's interest foremost. So another example of uh, client autonomy. So all of that's fine if you are sort of trying to protect the client and keep this normal relationship. But what happens when things fall apart? How do you know when to seek protective action? Do the comments tell us anything about that? So I'm, I'm suggesting this. When we go down to 1.14b, we made a decision that, as the comment says, uh, a normal client lawyer relationship cannot be maintained. So when we drop down to here, you're saying a normal, <coughs> and this means you've tried everything. You've tried to navigate you know, a normal client lawyer. Mr. Madeline, you had your hand up. Uh, just point to comment six, where it looks like the factors for determining the extent of diminished capacity. Mm -hmm. And the thing seems to be like the clients not only do understand the consequences of decisions that people are legally get rid of them. So I guess and this is going to vary from case to case, uh, but you have to make a determination about can this client function. And then it says uh, the lawyers should consider and balance these, these uh, factors. So you try to sort of what, notice this, you can use the rules as sort of a, uh, a test to see if the client can actually function. So for example, under 144, you're communicating with the client. You're advising within the scope of the representation. You're trying to have this give and take. And it seems like that cannot happen, at least consistently, or, consistently, or you reach a point where it's not happening at all. Then it's time to take protective action. So variability of state of mind, ability to appreciate the consequences of a decision, that can be very important. So notice that if, you, if the client can't understand the consequences of a particular decision, that sort of erodes this notion of informed consent. Because you can give a critical assessment, but if the client cannot accept that because of diminished capacity, uh, then you have a problem. There is no real effective attorney-client relationship. Uh, so you balance all of that, and you look at, it says in, the, in comment six, long-term commitments and values of the client. In appropriate circumstances, the client, the lawyer may seek guidance from an appropriate diagnostician. So there may be, and this is sort of like the last result, there may be a time when it's breaking down and you have to bring in a third party to this relationship to figure out uh, what's actually occurring. So what about comment seven? I just want to point that out. So comment six it talks about assessing diminished capacity. And comment seven talks about the protective measures themselves. What about that? This is telling you you may have to make an assessment about how far to go uh, in having an appointment of someone outside of the attorney-client relationship. And it even says within the rule, uh, you should try and advocate the least restrictive action on behalf of the client. So a conservator or guardian ad litem may be necessary, but you go through all of the least restrictive alternatives first, and if it has to be that way, then, then that's fine. But you go through all of, it, uh, all of the alternatives that are available to you. So back to the book, if you look on page 235, there is a discussion about really lawyers in any context avoiding being uh, too uh, paternalistic. And in this article by uh, Professor <coughs> Trimley, uh, he argues that you should try to preserve client autonomy. And so and to him, and this is his argument, guardian ad litem is uh, legitimate in extreme cases. If you can rely upon a family, that might be the least coercive approach. Non-coercive uh, persuasion is justified in less extreme cases. And he also argues that unilateral uh, usurpation of the client's autonomy is never appropriate. So his entire article really talks about preserving uh, client autonomy. See that on the top of page 237. I'm sorry, 236. Okay, now this last problem in uh, chapter five, final windows. So the reason we talked about this, we can apply some of what we've been talking about to this, all of what we've been talking about to this case. So go through the facts of this and sort of advise the client, if that is possible. Typical scenario, we have an 830 client, Mary McKay, a widow living in this house for 50 years, house is in good, good condition, uh, and we come to find out that she has entered into some type of contract with a window uh, company it seems like a typical type of uh, scam scenario. Doesn't really need uh, windows, but she signs some papers anyway. The salesman asks for money. Each time they come to do work, she continually goes to the bank to get money to pay for the work. The project is completed, in quotation marks. The workers ask for a last payment of $900. Our client, McKay, complains that the work isn't up to par. They've broken some things. Shabby workmanship, she refuses to pay. Uh, there is a claim filed in small claims court in which this company, Stormguard, says that she agreed to pay $8,900 but never paid the final $900. So it seems like our client is a bit confused about how much money she paid, has to pay. Uh, documents are kind of shaky. When we ask to see the contract receipt or other documents, 
uh, Hermione Griffin, she just starts talking about, she calls the workers those crazy boys. It seems like she likes the company maybe, and this could be her uh, just having workers around so that she will have company and won't be lonely. That's a consideration. Uh, but she thinks that also that the installers may have stolen uh, $400 in cash that she had uh, lying around. So we have some options. I think we need to think some options. One thing that we know is that the lawyer for Stormguard uh, is a settler. He just wants to sell a thing. Uh, since we owe $900, the settlement price would probably be $450. Uh, and he usually takes this course, and the, the, she could probably move on for four hundred fifty dollars. And so these options are laid out on the top of page two thirty eight. You pay the full amount. We could settle, wait until trial, be prepared to accept an offer of four hundred fifty dollars. We could defend vigorously, because just like in that other case where we checked and found out some things about the Washington City contract, probably the same thing uh, can happen in this particular case. We could have defenses on duress, inconscionability, misrepresentation. You see that on page two thirty eight. Maybe we get aggressive and counterclaim based upon poor workmanship damage to the wall, not being licensed as a contractor. <coughs> or maybe we just uh, do sort of a status quo type thing, just get the company to repair the windows and we'll <coughs> leave it at that, we'll move on. <coughs> so those are our options. And it seems like she understood that we're required to respond to the lawsuit, but she's having a hard time making up her mind about what to do. So notice how this problem is trying to push us to use our expertise. We want to balance that, she's sort of uh, in and out in terms of being lucid about making decisions, but she knows that the clock is ticking but just can't make a decision. Whenever we try to make her make a decision, she goes back to talking about the business and the crazy boys and all that. Uh, so we agree to represent her in a dispute with a stone, a stone guard without charging a fee. She has no living relatives, but she has a neighbor across the street, uh, Mrs. Houston. She sees every now and then. So what makes this time sensitive is uh, that in terms of our litigation strategy, we usually take an aggressive approach. We want to push back. Uh, stone guard has been pushing our client, and we want to sort of level the playing field by doing something somewhat aggressive. Uh, we think that she should not pay any more money. We should follow a counterclaim. But if we want to file a common claim, we only have a couple of days. Maybe it's today, it's Thursday, we have a, until maybe Monday. <coughs> we have to file it within a few days. The trial date is in a week, but we probably could obtain a short continuance. So we have to file these papers by this coming Monday, and the trial will be this coming Thursday, a week from today. So we are going right after this class to see McKay and talk to her. And it's a good probability that she's not going to be able to decide. So what should we do? What should we do under Rule 1.14? Can we go to her later on today? Say, look, you need to make a decision. This is what we have to do. This will protect your rights. And you may not fully understand it now, but this is what I have to do as the attorney. Uh, and we're moving forward. We're going to follow this counterpoint. Just sign here. Can you do that? I'm protecting your interests. You're waving back and forth. I have to stand up for you. This is the way I'm going to do it. Here are the papers signed, and we'll, we'll follow them later on this afternoon. And I'll come back a little bit later before trial, and we'll talk about what I just did. But we have to move on this day. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, not label my client. <coughs> not saying she has to miss. You just can't make this decision. I'm going to make it for you. Follow these papers, uh, and I'll come back around and we'll have a good discussion about whatever. I'm protecting your interest. Can I do that? It's also, I'm doing a good thing, right? I'm protecting my client. So, what's my, and uh, I'm not labeling this Mrs. McCabe in any way. I'm not saying you have diminished capacity. I'm saying I am your agent. We have these goals. I know that we both want to push back against Stormguard. Now's the time to do it. The clock is ticking. I'm acting on your behalf this time. Anything wrong with that? Or one approach would be uh, am I maintaining a normal client lawyer relationship? Or am I being uh, too paternalistic? Or maybe it's my job to be paternalistic if she's not making the decision. So what about this? Uh, a normal relationship may not be possible, so I'm going to direct her to file the counterclaim. Look, this is what we have to do. That's what you hired me for. Sign it. We're ready. Can you do that? <coughs> or better yet, what would you do? Just follow what would you do? How would you sort of express that to her so that you're not overbearing and she's making a decision? <coughs> That's the thing. I think give her like more than one plan, uh, but kind of show her the benefits of one and how they kind of overshadow the other one. Uh, so she can still make a decision, but maybe if you're pretty clear about which one's better, one, she'll do Yeah, and uh, so you sort of make sure that she has all the options. Emphasize that we're under tight time constraints and we might lose our ability to get your story out there if we don't take action. Uh, but you're right by focusing on, well, it yeah. almost seems like she's all alone, so we really have to balance uh, using our will to make her make a decision because uh, we want to preserve client autonomy even in the face of diminished capacity. Keep in mind, Ms. Houston is there as well. We're going to see in a real case she comes around, but Ms. Houston's neighbor might be able uh, to, to give us the help. Yeah. I would say it's kind of tricky because um, it's a little bit tricky because the counterclaim would also kind of go to her capacity, I think. If that's like the Tell me about trip. that, yeah. What do you mean? I mean, if you're going to say, like, she didn't have the capacity to contract with them because she spent most of her savings on windows she didn't really need, like, that would probably be the basis of the counterclaim. So I feel like you would have to, like, communicate that to her, which would be hard. And also, I don't know how we're playing with this rule. Really, well, I, I, so if, if I were drafting this counterclaim, I would try and stay away from her decision making 
decision-making capacity and focus more directly on what the company did. And they boxed all of these things, and so then our argument will be, why should we pay for it? I mean, the windows are leaking, there's damage to the wall, uh, you're unlicensed, all of those uh, things uh, say that you can't collect money if you're unlicensed from uh, a customer. So all of those things focus on workmanship but about her uh, capacity coming into question. Now, of course, if I set it up that way, that underlying question that you're highlighting is definitely going to come out at some point, so that's some type of risk that we're going to have to look at. Because they're going to ask, what, what did you sign, what did you think you were going to get, what's your mutual assent, did you agree to this, all of that, and, and what was wrong with this, uh, what was uh, Oh, it's done by the contractor. So yeah, that would be that would be it. So what do you think? Maybe uh, we don't direct her because that would be too pushy. What about just telling her you have to make a decision? Uh, tell her what we think she should do, and don't force our views on her. And then maybe as the father says, get the different options and you pick one. That might work. But are we so far that maybe we need to appoint somebody? Was the guardian allowed to be too much? Because mm -hmm. we have time to just wait. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, how much are you supposed to like test her out? Yeah. Like her capacity. So notice this, what we did was we went to uh, what an attorney and client can do together. If we have a client who can't even tell us the basis of the counterclaim or the facts that would help her case, that's a problem. So if, if you're in this situation, you want to look at comment five, and that's going to help you make, I mean, it's not going to cover up. This isn't exhaustive, but uh, we are saying now that we can't maintain this relationship. We have asked her to be engaged. We've asked her about documents. We've asked her about claims. We've asked her to make some type of decision about motion practice, and she can't do any of those things. So our next step will be consulting with family members. Maybe she doesn't have any family members. Uh, maybe we can sort of use a reconsideration period, but we're on the time pressure. Uh, and so in taking protective action, the lawyer should be guided by such factors as the wishes and values of the client to the extent known. So we know that we want to defend against storm guard, the client's best interest, and the goals of intruding into the client's decision-making autonomy to the least extent feasible. So no real answer there, but if she cannot make decisions, then we need to talk to someone else. And I think we might be at that point. Maximize client capacities and respecting the client's family and social connection. So once we make this decision that, then we have to take protective action. We consider all of those things. We might have to talk to Ms. Hughes if we say the client cannot adequately act in her own interest. So, you know, we have the Department of Social Services, maybe Ms. Houston. We can talk to Ms. Houston about uh, McKay, but we would re reveal information about the client only to the extent reasonably necessary uh, to protect the client's interest. That maintains the client's autonomy and privacy. So no another thing that should bother us is that when we are involved with third party in the attorney client relationship, that's gonna cause some disruption, whether we're on the same uh, side or not. And that's gonna uh, cause some disruption. What do you think uh, actually happened? Like most things in life, things sort of unravel, and you gotta put results in quotation marks, but uh, just the ramifications are devastating. So there came a point that we are now in terms of talking about this problem where uh, we find that McKay just can't uh, handle this situation. Uh, one, and this is a clinic case. I think once the students went over to her home and they just found her staring at an open refrigerator. And so they became concerned because they worried that she might fall prey to other salesmen, uh, that she might not get enough food and, and care, no one to look after her. So the students contact, contacted the Department of Social Services. She was then visited by a government social worker who decided that she was unable to look after herself. The social worker contacted neighbors and persuaded one of them uh, to petition the court to become a case conservator. That was Ms. Houston in our problem. The law, notice this, so in terms of representation, competency, area of expertise, scope of representation, the clinic did not represent uh, Mrs. Houston in the conservatorship uh, petition. That was beyond uh, their level of expertise. Uh, so they found a separate free counsel to represent Houston in, in this proceeding. Uh, they did not defend the case from the conservatorship uh, petition. If you're on the same page, this is a client who doesn't have decision-making power. There's nothing really to preserve in terms of client autonomy. So they get a separate attorney to uh, petition for the conservatorship. Uh, in the meantime, the students persuaded the creditor to hold the litigation in advance during this conservatorship uh, proceeding. After the court appointed Houston as conservator, they authorized the students to file uh, the counterclaim about the workmanship. They did that. Uh, on the basis of the counterclaim, the basis of the counterclaim was that since Stormguard uh, was an unlicensed contractor, uh, this was in D.C. Under D.C. law, the consumer was entitled to refund any amount she paid the contractor before the work was completed. So while all of this was going on, the cave uh, health deteriorates. She becomes unable to live independently. Her savings are becoming depleted. So then Houston as conservator sells McKay's house and moves her into a nursing home. It proceeds from the house to uh, help maintain her in the nursing home. Eventually, the clinic recovers all of the money uh, that McKay had paid for Stormguard. Uh, and that money, again, was used to help for McKay's uh, living expenses. But the unfortunate and sad thing is that by the time that they won this case, uh, McKay was unable to understand uh, that she had been victorious in his action. So notice that this request for $900 uh, in small claims dispute, and the client would request our help, uh, resulted in all of these sort of life consequences occurring. And now, since she needed the care, I guess that was a good result, but it certainly was not one that she uh, intended. Uh, so recovery of all the money, but look at all of the uh, consequences. So that was the final windows. Now, <coughs> page uh, 240. So one limitation about this rule, some of you taking family law, is that when we talk about diminished capacity, we just talk about uh, minors, but really treat the minors like adults almost. And so there is no a specialized standard to take into account that you're in a different context when you're representing minors, that uh, different interests and standards are uh, at stake, best interests of the child, those type of things. 
But the little really doesn't reference that. Under one point one four, we just have a mention of uh, minority. That's it. And so the book makes the point that on page two forty that the rule really lumps everyone together without the nuance and uh, specialization that you would need to recognize that juveniles are different, both in terms of their needs and the context in which their uh, matters are, are, occur. So one reference that is made here is the ADA standard of practice for lawyers representing the child. This was a set of model standards that was used to say you're in a different context, you have different interests, and you represent a child. But the major thing that should be emphasized is that this notion of client autonomy uh, carries through when we're talking about juveniles. We want undivided loyalty, we want preserved confidentiality, we want competent representation, and we want advocacy for the child's best interest. So in, in that manner, this undivided loyalty, confidentiality, and competent representation, in terms of that reality, the child is the same thing as an adult a client. But this, these standards are used to sort of recognize that uh, children's issues come up in a different context. But all the time, you're trying to preserve client autonomy. There is a duty, you see on top of page 241, uh, to protect uh, client confidences indefinitely. So just because the lawyer-client relationship terminates, does not mean, oh, I'll wash my hands if I can say anything I want to. That, that goes on uh, indefinitely. I think that's comment 20 to rule uh, 1.6. Uh, there's also this notion that on page 242, after the termination of an attorney-client relationship, uh, you can give back what the client is entitled to, papers, that type of thing, uh, return money that you've not done work for, all of that. Uh, but your own internal interpretation, say you keep a diary log of your assessments of, of clients and how they interact with you, the staff, and how they assess situations, and it's sort of like a personality strategy uh, internal file that you keep, and the client wants that. No, you, that is protected, that is your uh, impression. And the lawyer may refuse to return uh, that, not entitled to internal paper. The lawyer may also refuse to return uh, original documents when there is an unpaid bill, but you can't do that in a way that is uh, heavy-handed and looks like a source. You have to sit down and explain to the client <coughs> that non-payment uh, it seriously impacts the attorney-client relationship, uh, and the lawyer may retain the documents that he created for the client. Uh, so, but notice there's this language, you can retain it, but retention cannot be unreasonably harmful to the client. Now, if you look at one last thing, 1.16, declining or terminating representation. So, if you look at this rule, so now we sort of look at the attorney, total attorney client relationship, and now this is what happens when uh, the relationship ends. So it says, it's up, as stated in paragraph C, and paragraph C says that a, a lawyer can be compelled to uh, stay on the case in order to do so by the tribunal. But it's up, as a lawyer shall not represent a client, or if the representation has began, shall withdraw from the representation if, so this is mandatory withdrawal, let's put that. Uh, violation of law. So if, if your representation will result in violation of law, that's kind of true. quick impairment. The lawyer cannot function as a lawyer because of some physical or mental impairment. Uh, the lawyer is discharged. So the client says you're fired, that's mandatory. So those are the three instances where withdrawal is mandatory under 1.168, 1 through 3. You continue represent the representation is a violation of law. You cannot carry forward the representation because of some impairment or you're discharged. So this is shall. One point one six B is permissive. So there is several things. The lawyer may withdraw from representing the client if this is going to be B one, uh, and this is the broadest. If you can do so without material adverse effect on the interest of the client, <coughs> or two, if the client persists in a course of conduct uh, involving your services being used in criminal or fraudulent conduct. So we know that we've set several different rules saying uh, we can't do that. So permissive may. You look at comment seven, it talks about all the permissive. Uh, so the broadest is you can do it without material impact on the client, or two, our services are being used for crime or fraud, and the client persists in that, or three, the client has used our services and we find out about it. Four is the client insists upon taking action the lawyer considers repugnant. Now that's, just, that's sort of a falling out between attorney and client. The lawyer has such a fundamental disagreement with the client that representation cannot go forward. That's 1.16B4. And then five, the client <coughs> fails to fulfill a substantial obligation, like money. Six is an unreasonable burden. So say you're a civil rights law firm, this is another 1.16 B6. If it results in an unreasonable financial burden, this litigation has been going on for 10 years, it's not getting anywhere, it's taking up all of uh, your time, not getting paid, and it's impacting uh, your firm's bottom line, permissive withdrawal. And then uh, there's other good causes as well. So let me, I just want to uh, highlight what comment seven says about permissive withdrawal.
So it says optional withdrawal. So well, B127. But if you look at comment seven. So it just says we can withdraw in some circumstances. And then it just goes through one through seven. So what comment seven really highlights is the, the factors under 1.16 where it's optional. But you'll see in each of those scenarios, uh, the lawyer is exercising uh, his discretion. Very broadly, we can withdraw just if there's no material uh, impact on our client, all the way to good cause for withdrawal. And that's the discussion uh, starting on page 243 all the way to 247. Now, one final point is, uh, you just don't, well, I'm done withdrawing that. You have to try and have that discussion with the client, give the client some notice, and then if things don't work out, then that's how you withdraw. That's the discussion on the latter part of the chapter, page 246. So that is the attorney-client relationship. So having that basis of understanding of what that relationship is and how it can end, we're going to start first talking about conflicts with current clients, and then we're going to move through and talk about former clients, or specialized conflict rules, the revolving door, private lawyers, the government practice, government practice of private lawyers. That'll be happening a lot in the next year or so. This is administration's change during election year. Uh, and then uh, there's an overall discussion of, of how conflicts work. But today we're just going to start with uh, the building blocks of confidentiality. Uh, we look on chapter 6, we're on page 249. That's where we are. So, so the conflicts that we're going to be dealing with in Rule 1.7, current conflicts. What we're doing and who we're representing impacts the representation. And you see on page uh, 251, uh, those are the basic uh, scenarios. Uh, best of all possible worlds, when we're distinguishing these facts, and they're going to be fact specific, when we're distinguishing these facts, uh, we might be in a situation where we don't have a conflict, then we don't have a problem at all. That's fine. That's great. But, and what will concern us in this chapter, there could be a scenario where we do have a conflict. Now, that isn't the end of the analysis. Just because we have a conflict uh, does not mean, oh, we can't represent that person. The conflict may be consentable. In other words, after we inform the affected parties about this conflict, they understand everything, we've laid it out, they give informed consent, we still can represent. That'll be fine. That's, we're going to see that that is the way that 1.7 is set up. But there are some conflicts that are so severe that even consent cannot save. Say, for example, you represent, whenever you have a joint representation, you're going to be uh, very conscious of conflicts. Because even though you are united in common purpose, there could come a time when those interests diverge. Always happens. We're, we're starting out trying to uh, win against the prosecutor in this criminal case. Uh, but things change when the liberty interest is on the line. So say you had a joint representation in a criminal case, uh, and both parties uh, consent, and everything's going along fine. But as things sort of develop, you find more information, and it's clear uh, that client number two is guilty, and that this united front isn't going to be beneficial to client number one. And you have a decision to make. And so you continue this joint representation, but and you and you sort of fully inform the uh, clients. You continue this joint representation, but you make the decision to throw client two under the bus in order to save client one. And it goes all the way up through appeal. And then uh, your argument throughout these proceedings is that both clients consent. In fact, one of them recognized that. Uh, he would be sacrificed for the other client. He thought that maybe the prosecution couldn't prove everything beyond reasonable doubt anyway, and client number two and client number one give informed consent and quotation marks to this joint representation. What do you think the court would decide on appeal? And I'm in trouble, but, but I say, no, this, this is informed consent. I told him all about this, and client two said he wanted to do this. He consented to this, uh, and that's fine. This was a risk that we decided to take. Informed consent, no conflict. What do you think the court would say? In other words, would informed consent save me? from being disciplined because I continue the representation in the face of this conflict. And I would say, well, no, I have consent from both parties to do this, so it's okay. Is there a situation where a conflict is non-consentable? Yes. Is this one of those instances? What do you think? What do you think? If you look at the top of page 251, is that sort of conflict that I just described so serious? That even consent doesn't save it. There are some cases like that. What do you think? You think the court will say that's okay? That's a four percent. Yes. But you have to be careful. What I want to illustrate is that informed consent may not always uh, remove the conflict. 
and the court would probably say uh, that that goes to the court of representation. You're almost asking a defendant to uh, waive the constitutional right of confrontation and expose uh, himself to uh, a criminal liability that could result in a long jail term uh, simply because he wants to take the risk of the prosecution to prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, you have a client actively acquiescing in a self sacrifice so that the attorney can pick one client over the other. And that's going to be sort of a clear example of conflict. We're going to do a variation of something like that uh, as one of the problems. In this chapter. So there are some things where we don't have a conflict, there are some things where we do have a conflict, but it's consentable, and then there are going to be some scenarios, rare, because most things are consentable, rare, when a conflict is so fundamental, so uh, disruptive to the attorney client relationship uh, that it is not consentable. Conflicts that are so serious that even consent would not solve the problem. And the lawyer should turn down the second client. So we're going to do current conflicts. Then we're going to look at different types of particular current conflicts in Chapter 7. We're going to then do successive conflicts where we look at former representation and what we are representing currently. Talk about imputation a bit. Then we're going to talk about uh, the client and lawyer's self-interest conflicting as Chapter 9. And then Chapter 10 talks about uh, present and former government attorneys. <coughs> and how they move over. So, somebody tell me how Rule 1.7 works. It gives us a definition of what the conflict is, uh, and then tells us even if there is a conflict, it may be consentable if we can make these uh, if we can meet these requirements. So, except as provided in paragraph B, paragraph B says even if there is a conflict, it may be consentable, and, here, and here's how. Now, this paragraph look at this: a lawyer mandatory shall not represent a client. If the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. So how do we know something is a concurrent conflict of interest? The rule tells us a concurrent conflict of interest exists if representation would be directly adverse. Notice this, directly adverse to another client. So you pick up this one matter currently, you represent, and then there's someone else that you're also representing around the time, and what you do will be against that client. Directly versus to another client, or, so this is the most direct kind. You, you are actually going against the interest of one of your clients. Bad. Undermine another matter loyalty, the client will feel like he or she is betrayed, betrayed. <coughs> actively, actively going against someone you are supposed to represent. Follow those building blocks that we, we talked about before. So we shall not represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. A concurrent conflict of interest exists if taking the action will be directly adverse to another client or, oh sorry, that's totally limited. There's a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to another client. So that's somebody you're representing now, notice this, or a former client, or a third person, or by personal interest of the lawyer. So two types of concurrent conflicts, those are directly adverse to the interest of another client, or the things that you can do for a current client are limited because of someone you represent currently, someone you represented in the past, former client, we're gonna talk about that on the 1.9, your own personal interest. So materially limited. So this responsibility is to another client, that's someone you still uh, represent now, currently, to another current client, you can say, to another client. Notice this, a former client, for 1.9. And you're going to see when we talk about former clients, we're going to have to do two things at the same time. We're going to have to look at who we're representing currently, and then we're going to have to look backward at what we've previously done and see how that impacts this current representation. So that's what we're talking about, materially limited. So in other words, I'm representing an entity or a criminal defendant or anything, uh, and I'm limited in what I can do currently by what I did in the past. That was so materially. I cannot fully consider all the options. I cannot draft this uh, transaction in this particular way, because I've done something before that impacts the way that I can carry out my responsibility. So responsibilities to another client, that's current. Responsibilities to a former client, or third person, or by personal interest. So we'll get into this personal interest and specialized thing when we talk about uh, Rule 1.8. Those are uh, specialized rules of conflict. So that's why we know that a concurrent conflict can be directly first to another client. And if it's not that, another way a conflict arises is if you are materially limited by your responsibilities to a current client, a former client, some third person outside of the attorney-client relationship, or by the lawyer's personal interest. So, someone tell me a little bit more about directly adverse. So I represent a uh, client in the Title VII employment discrimination, so I'm representing the plaintiff in that action. 
uh, and then there is a auto accident, and I think I'm okay. Now, I've done all the checks and everything, but I just don't notice the name, or maybe the name is misspelled. So I'm representing a client in a Title Seven action. It turns out that I am against the same client uh, in an auto accident case. And so I, uh, a little bit rusty on uh, PR, I've been practicing for years and years, but I, said, I just do it by common sense. Uh, that's totally unrelated. In other words, I'm representing employment discrimination under Title Seven. that's fine, I'm representing the client, but I'm also suing this client in a personal injury automobile case. No conflict, right, because it's not related, right? Matt? That's the kind of adverse. You should be representing both of those clients, even in unrelated matters, and if you're representing one in a situation where they're adverse to the other, it doesn't matter if you're representing both at the same time. Okay, that's good. So, but, but why can't, you see, this is uh, what gets people, even people who uh, practice law. Well, I'll just use common sense. That's unrelated. My client shouldn't feel, uh, this is um, advancing your rights under employment discrimination, and this other thing, that's the auto thing, that's unrelated. Uh, but I guess what really we're concerned about is, you're for this client in one action and against the client in the other action. And that's what makes it, and so made a big deal, this is why we made a big deal about undivided loyalty, protecting confidences, communication, diligence. Uh, you, you are all in uh, for your client. And look at common sense, this is important. Uh, loyalty to a client prohibits undertaking representation directly versus the client without that client's informed consent. So I guess you could say, I'm uh, with you on this title seven, but this auto thing is coming up, you give me informed consent. I think the client would say, no, I think you're that, that bad and I don't want to do that. Uh, but you could if, if informed consent was given. But after informed consent, the lawyer may not act as an advocate in one matter against the lawyer represented in some other matter, even when the matters are wholly unrelated. So that's common sense talks about uh, directly at first. That's good. So this, this is a simple proposition. If undivided loyalty means anything, it should mean that the client should be confident that her own attorney will not turn against her. In some matter, whether related or not. And then same thing for materially limited. So notice this, even if there is no direct adverseness, you have to go down to the next level too. Is there still a concurrent conflict? So you say, I know I cannot represent a client if there's a concurrent conflict absent informed consent. If it's directly adverse, I'll, I'll, I can't do it. And even if it's not directly adverse, I still have to ask the next question, may it be materially limited? So comment eight says, even if there is no direct adverse, you're not going directly against the client, the conflict of interest is this, if there's a significant risk that a lawyer's ability to consider, recommend, or carry out an appropriate course of action is limited. Materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to someone else. So, and, and it points to joint, the joint representation scenario. <coughs> which is classic because Notice you start off with a commonality of interest. Like in this upcoming problem, we want to beat the taxi cab company. That's the commonality of interest. But then the question is, what happens when interests diverge? If everybody starts off on the same page, but as we move through this litigation, then uh, things might, might change. So you have a little chart on page 255, that's what we've just been doing. And then on page uh, 256, So, when you evaluate conflicts, I want to point this out. This is what we'll be doing. If you look at comment two, it talks about how to evaluate co conflicts. So, this is going to tell us if something is directly versus or materially limited. So, notice what it, what it says we have to do. This is what we're going to do in every uh, case when we talk about conflict. We're going to <coughs> clearly identify the client. <coughs> that's one. We want to <coughs> determine whether conflict is this. That's asking this question. Is it directly adverse or is it materially limited? Then we're going to we're going to look at 1.7b. Let's put 1.7b. That is, even though a conflict is this. Is it consentable? And then if you, if you went through 1.7, we'll do that when we come back. Uh, 1.7b, you have the requirement. Even though there is a conflict, the lawyer makes a determination, I can provide competent and diligent representation. Representation is not prohibited by law. I'm not on the same side of the being the same action or claim. And informed consent. If all three of those are met, then it is consentable. So what comment two actually does is it, it tracks rule 1.7 and tells you how to uh, analyze conflict. That's on page uh, 260. So when we come back, we are going to start with the injured passengers on page 269. So look at 1.7 again, and then look at these two clients. Commonality of interest is they want to defeat the taxi cab company and show liability. But if you look at Gio and Rima, they are going to have different interests. And then the question is, how do you structure this joint representation so it can go forward? Have a good weekend.